All right, so today I wanna to talk about why I don't use Rails personally and professionally. This is a question I get asked a lot on like Discord DMs or Twitter DMs, and I thought it'd just be easier to talk about it in a video as opposed to always copying and pasting the answer everywhere uh, because people will look at like my blog, which uses WordPress, my e-commerce store, which uses Shopify, or my e-learning platform, which uses Thinkific. Uh, and they'll ask like why I don't use Rails for those because you know you teach a, a Ruby on Rails YouTube channel largely it does cover some software stuff uh, but you teach those things on on YouTube and then people are like well why don't you use it do you hate Rails uh, and I talk about it in my videos sometimes where I make these Rails tutorials and I'll make the comment that like I don't use Rails personally or professionally so why not uh, professionally speaking I worked at a company that used .NET and Vue. Uh, and it used it for some stuff that required some system level calls on Windows and Linux. So for Windows, if you're not familiar, uh, just go ahead and try to install Rails on a Windows device without using any sort of containerization and then try to start your Rails server. Chances are it's not gonna work because the Windows support is non-existent at this point. It's honestly pretty much a lie that it, it's even called cross-platform in that sense because the Windows solution for Rails is to use WSL so you can have a Linux OS in your Windows OS and then just run Rails on Linux. So that's kind of a, a misnomer there. And as you're probably aware, when you're working on a desktop application, sometimes you don't have access to stuff like WSL and WSL isn't really good for production applications. It's good for development. So that, that's one thing to keep in mind. Now, the other part of it is like, why didn't we use Rails for the Linux side of things? Well, first of all, it was a C-sharp company. Uh, the customer already paid for a C-sharp project. The customer is probably not gonna be interested in uh, me saying, well, what if we take like the Windows solution and just reinvent the whole thing in a different framework when we already have like C Sharp and .NET, which is already cross-platform to an extent. And you can just say, all right, we'll take most of this, throw it in Linux, and then we'll just do an OS check to see like if we're in Windows or Linux when we have to do stuff with like the file system. So in that case, it didn't really make sense to use Rails for that uh, environment, right? So, okay, that's professionally. Uh, I didn't get a job as a Rails dev, so I didn't use Rails, right? Personally, why don't I use it? Well, some of the things I do, like this right here, which is a 3D printed housing. I'm not gonna 3D print using Rails. I'm gonna use like whatever G code is. Uh, and this is a Arduino, which is, uh, I think it uses like something similar to like C sharp almost for the code. Uh, but it is a uh, low level embedded framework or programming language that you can use for uh, like small little systems. So a good example is this little Arduino board I have right here which is connected to a breadboard mostly, has a joystick and it has a seven segment display. So if I move the joystick uh, and this is turned on, it'll show me what's, uh, I, I don't know, which direction I'm pointing the joystick in uh, on the Arduino. I'm not gonna use Rails for that, right? Like that makes no sense. You're not gonna use a web server for a uh, little circuit like that. You're just gonna use whatever programming language comes with it. But what about like games? Because we've done a tutorial on the channel that used 3JS, which is a animation framework that can make games. And we've done a tutorial on the channel for Godot, which is a game engine that we threw into a Rails server. Well, as you're probably aware, uh, websites like RuneScape exist. There are online games. Sometimes you don't want to make a online game. Sometimes you want to make like, I don't know, Fortnite or Rocket League or Halo or whatever, Animal Crossing. And in those cases, you're gonna be making a desktop game or a console game. And in that case, you can use Godot, but you can also use game engines like Unity or uh, Unreal Engine 5, which personally speaking, I prefer Unreal Engine 5 and I have assets in Unity. So I'm gonna use those two over Godot because they're just the better tool for the job. Now I'm not able to throw either of those onto a Rails application. So Rails doesn't really even fit into the equation similar to the uh, Arduino uh, discussion. So in that case, like, again, I'm not gonna be using it for my personal projects, but okay. What about my personal web development projects? Well, I didn't use it for my blog because my blog runs on WordPress, which is used by like 40% of the internet or something obscene like that. Uh, and it, the reason is WordPress is really fast to get set up, especially when you're working 50 hours a week and you don't have a lot of time. Uh, but at the time, I also didn't really know what I was doing with the blog. I didn't know where I wanted to take it. I knew I wanted to do e-commerce and a learning platform in the future. So I thought, realistically, I have access to like WooCommerce with the blog. And I'm sure there's some way for me to do like video lessons or something as well. 
in that case, all of those things together, having plugins for most of them was very appealing as opposed to Rails where something like Spree, which was supposed to be the tutorial for today, wasn't up to date with the version of Rails that I was I would have been running because uh, in Rails 5, there were some issues with active storage and permanent links. Uh, basically, if you uploaded images to your website, your SEO would suffer with active storage because you didn't have permanent URL links, which means that Google couldn't link your images uh, it, they wouldn't be indexed because the URL kept changing because there wasn't a permanent option. That got fixed with Rails 6, but when I tried to make the blog using Rails 6, Spree was only supported on Rails 5. Currently, Spree is only supported on Rails 6. It doesn't support Rails 7 yet, so it's a similar situation where uh, you sort of run into this issue where like everything's sort of out of sync a little bit. And with WordPress, that's not really an issue because if Spree doesn't work, there's 13 other different WooCommerce alternatives that you can throw into a WordPress website because it's so, so popular. With Rails, we're still waiting for like Devise to update to Rails 7 so that we stop having to do 13 different workarounds just to get a basic authentication working with Turbo. So it's all pretty in the box already. And if it's not in the box, you just go to the store and you get it for free. With Rails, you can have like gems installed, but you're doing a lot of the work yourself for building this stuff. And although you can have like a bare bones blog that you can create, the blog itself in like a Rails app, if you create a scaffold, you add action text, you do the uh, rich text area in your model and your controller and your, your forms, even at that point, you can now write a blog and you can have like videos embedded in it, but who's gonna read it? If you're DHH, you can say, oh, here's my Hey blog, isn't this cool? It's the best thing ever, it's super simple. But for the rest of us, we don't have DHH's audience. So we have to go out and find that audience. And the way you do that is either by having a YouTube channel like I do, but at the time I had 2000 subscribers, so it wasn't big enough to really leverage like that. Or you have to deal with the SEO ranking in Google because although good content will bubble to the top, it'll only bubble to the top if it at least has an initial audience that gets some impressions from it. In that case, you're going to want to use SEO tools. Stuff like Yoast is already a plugin that's built into WordPress. That made my life easier. So a lot of these factors combined together, uh, like the ability to check what's being searched in the search bar to see who's trying to exploit the website and how, having stuff like WordFence uh, and all of that integrated with like Cloudflare and the integrations with Google Analytics. It all sort of came together with WordPress, where with Rails, it could have come together, but it would have been a lot more work. And since I was already pretty tired after work, I wasn't looking to do more work before I then started on the YouTube videos again. So I had to like prioritize my time. So in that case, I went with WordPress. What about Shopify? Well, it's like this gold standard application everyone points to and says, look, Rails can scale. Rails is fantastic. Rails is the best thing ever. But then as soon as you start to use it, people are like, well, why are you using Shopify? So just making your own application. And I think this one's more of like a, uh, a problem people have in the software space with prioritizing the software solution over the business solution. So although you can go out and reinvent the wheel, if the wheel has already been invented, just go use the wheel. So Shopify already has integrations with Printful, which is like a print on demand service. So if you want to throw your logo onto like a mug or a t-shirt or pants or whatever, uh, a pair of like Speedos, you can. And then through Printful, you can then have the order placed in Shopify. It goes through, it takes the money out of your account, places the order through Printful, and then the order in Shopify goes into your account. So you never really lost money and you never have to touch the physical merchandise. Now I'm sure Printful has like a integration thing you could set up, but in all honesty with Shopify, it's like install plugin, log into account and you're, you're integrated, right? And that was a pretty big deal for me, getting all that stuff done out of the box again, because I don't want to have to deal with it. The only person who visits my e-commerce store is my mom to buy some mugs. So I don't necessarily need to worry about like uh, how technically in-depth the solution is or how groundbreaking it is, what my secret sauce for my, my store is. I was just like, man, I would love to be able to spin something up and be done with it, which is what I was able to do with the help of Shopify. And the last thing I want to talk about is like Thinkific. So this is my e-learning platform, which sounds a lot cooler than it is. I have one course on there right now, and this one has by far the biggest overhead. So WordPress is free to host on your own website. I have a tutorial that covers how to do that. It takes 12 minutes. You throw on like a digital ocean droplet and you're largely done. The droplet will be like five bucks a month. Shopify, I don't have to host on my own server. I would if it was a Rails app. 
uh, but because it's a uh, on its own uh, like service, I have to pay the service fee, which is thirty dollars a month, I think, for Shopify. In terms of Thinkific, it is like a hundred dollars a month for the tier that I'm on, maybe a hundred and thirty. Uh, and the reason is it has like a whole bunch of backend analytics that I can see to see who's watching the course and to what point. Is that necessary? Not really, not for, for most people, but for me, because I, I already know how I wanna scale the course platform. I know I'm gonna want those analytics in the future. And I don't even know how to start integrating like a Hoy and chart kick into a uh, analytics package that tracks like average view duration, click through rate, impressions on videos, similar to how YouTube does it. With Thinkific, that's all thrown into like one singular dashboard and I can largely call it a day. So that was sort of why I went with it. It had all of the stuff built out of the box again. It was a, a full fledged solution and I could just throw it together. It also integrates with Shopify very well, which is something I would have had to build myself if I was making my own website. It all ultimately boils down to if I'm making a project, I'm gonna choose the right tool for the job. And a lot of times it's not Rails. Uh, which might be like a sacrilegious thing to say, but it really isn't. Like if you're making an embedded system, it's not Rails. If you're making a game, it's not Rails. If you're, I don't know, doing like hospital accounting records on a Windows device, it's not for Rails. If you're running tablet stuff, it's not for Rails. Uh, if it's a web development project, I'll look at it in terms of like, where would I save the most time? So if I'm trying to make like my own social media platform, I might use Rails because there my side project is like this custom software solution where the software solution is entirely web-based and a Rails approach would allow me to prototype it very quickly. But if I'm making a blog, I can prototype that very quickly, but can I scale it quickly? Now Rails can scale, but is my ability to scale the software going to be faster or slower with Rails? It's gonna be a lot slower than WordPress because if I need like a whole firewall solution on my website, with WordPress, I install a plugin. With Rails, I, I pray that I find the one gem that might still be up to date for that solution. In terms of like e-commerce, there's all the payment stuff you have to deal with. With Shopify, that's all integrated right away. Same thing with the Thinkific course, all of the payments handled through Thinkific, which you can integrate with Shopify so that there's like cross service orders, the printful printing on demand service. Like a lot of the third party integrations are gonna be figured out by these large platforms because they have millions of dollars invested into making it as all encompassing as possible because they're all in like this contest with each other to be the one person who makes all the money. I wasn't really interested in competing with all of that. I wasn't interested in creating my own solutions. I just wanted to create the platform or service as quickly as possible and move on with my life. But yeah, all of that is to say that like I use the right tool for the job and I prioritize my time uh, as, as a business, I guess, over my uh, software engineering skill set. So although I like to look at things in terms of being like a software developer, uh, I usually try to say, is there a more efficient way than me building this from scratch? And yeah, like I'm not gonna build a web server from scratch. I have Rails for that. I'm not gonna build a blog in Rails when I can already spin something up in WordPress that has a lot more features built in where I don't have to like go and invent a comment section, for example. I can just check the little box that has comments in WordPress and then I now have comments. It would probably be more robust if I built the whole solution for myself, but it's a blog with like 20 posts on it. I don't need to go building an entire blog CMS solution for that content management system uh, when WordPress already does that for me. So yeah, hopefully this didn't offend people too much. It's just like, this has sort of been my approach to uh, running these, these small projects. Uh, and that's sort of why I don't use Rails for my own personal and professional projects. But yeah, so hopefully this was like, I don't know, interesting or whatever. Uh, if you do have a alternative to Spree for e-commerce and Rails, please let me know because the Spree gem is currently outdated and I don't know when it'll be updated to Rails 7 and I wanted to cover a full featured uh, e-commerce solution, but the only one I really know about is Spree. So if you have any other options, please let me know down below. I appreciate it and hopefully I will see you in the next video.